Amen. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus said, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am in the light of the world. And when he had said these things, he spat on the ground, he made clay with the saliva, And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. So he went and he washed and he came back seeing. Therefore the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, Is not this he who sat and begged? And some said, This is he. And others said, He is like him. And he said, I am he. And therefore they said to him, How were your eyes opened? And he answered, and he said, a man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and I washed and I received sight. And then they said to him, where is he? And he said, I do not know. They brought him who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. Now it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also asked him again how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put clay on my eyes, I wash, and I see. And therefore, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them, and they said to the blind man again, what do you say about him, because he opened your eyes? And he said, he's a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him who had received his sight. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? And his parents answered and said to them, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But by what means he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He is of age, ask him. He'll speak for himself. And his parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that he was Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, He is of age, ask him. So they again called the man who was blind and said to him, Give God the glory that we know that this man is a sinner. And he answered them and said, Whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know, that... Thou was I was blind, and now I see. And then they said to him again, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered them, I told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you not want to hear it? Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And then they reviled him and said, You are his disciples, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses, for as this fellow, we do not know where he is from. The man answered and said to him, Why, this is a marvelous thing, that you do not know where he is from, yet he has opened my eyes. Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears them. Since the world began, it has been unheard of anyone that opened their eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not of God, he could not do nothing. And they answered him and they said, You were completely born in sins, and you're teaching us, and they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? And he answered, and he said, Who he is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus answered and said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who you was ta- who you are talking with. And he said to him, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. And Jesus said, for judgment, I have come into this world, that those who do not see may see, that those who see may be made blind. And then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard those words and said to him, are we blind also? And Jesus said to him, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now I say, we see, therefore your sin remains. Amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated this morning. Thank you for being here today. 
I want to just share a word with you very quickly this morning. I won't keep you more than an hour or so. Uh, <clears throat> if you would please take a moment and share this service on your Facebook page, we would appreciate it. We are believing God for 50. Last week we had over 4,000 people view our uh, Facebook Live, so help us with that. And by the way, if you would also help me welcome in our Facebook Live congregation this morning. <clears throat> We're so glad you're with us today. Need to make a real quick announcement that I was supposed to make at the beginning and forgot. Uh, tomorrow at 10 a.m. we are going to be working at the Hope Center. Anybody that is interested, we're painting and putting together beds. The house is big enough and have enough different rooms that we can separate folks out so they're not all gathered up together in one spot. So if you're interested in helping with that, you can let Kara know after the service. We'll probably spend two days up there, but before we announce Tuesday, we'd like to see what all we get accomplished tomorrow and how many people show up. So if you're available for that, we would surely appreciate it. 10 a.m. tomorrow. See Kara if you're interested, and she'll give you the address So if you don't know where it is. Thursday evening, this Thursday evening, between 6 and 8 p.m., we are going to set aside some time to pray over our Hope Center. Uh, we're asking you to do this from home, but sometime in those two hours to set aside some time to be in prayer about what God is doing. On the 8th, uh, the Hope Center guys will be here to help get things ready and set up computers and get offices set up and things of that nature. So... We are well on our way to opening up and having our first guys in the Hope Center. So just wanted to make you aware of that, that it is still moving forward. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <clears throat> if you have your Bibles this morning, I'd like for you to turn with me to Genesis chapter 1. I want to talk to you about God's framework. We seem to be living in a society that is shunning any kind of structure. But I want to remind you that God doesn't work without structure. And anytime we step outside of that structure, we end up in trouble. Karen and I have started our reading this year to read through the Bible together. And we've been, of course, reading in Genesis chapter 1 through, I think this morning we finished up in verse five or six or someplace like that. And you read a little bit in Genesis and a little bit in different parts of the Bible. But anyway, it has brought this to my attention. It's something that has went with everything we've done for the last few weeks anyway. And I feel like that it's necessary facing the situations that we're facing in our lives. And, and to be honest with you, even if we weren't facing uh, such major things, we need to come back to this. And uh, I want you to understand that there's safety in an authority structure. Let me, let me change that for a minute. There's safety in God's authority structure. Inside the family, inside the church, in the kingdom, there is structure, authority structure that is set up, and it's put in place, even in governmental, uh, as long as they haven't lost their minds, even in governmental authority, there is safety. And... Uh, we can't just get rid of it. Matter of fact, it will really be to our detriment if we do. Um, God always structures authority around people. There's a system that he always uses. And sometimes we don't like it. And one of the places we see that the most today, we see it about everywhere. We've abandoned the concept of any kind of real authority in our lives. And, uh, but we see it a lot in the family structure. We see where dads have become laughing stocks and jokes and uh, it used to frustrate me so much every time I'd see a commercial. It would show a mom walking into the store with two kids and her husband and the husband was acting like one of the kids who had to have permission if he could buy something in the store. And I'm like, man, we are just attacking that authority structure that God set in place. And you may say it's 2020 and we, 20, ooh, 2021. And that is archaic and old, but it is the structure God set up whether you like it or not. And that's the structure in which he moves most freely. Amen. 
don't have time to go into all that, and you, you should study that out. I thought maybe it would do us good to go back to the beginning and to start brand new and to see what it is that is God's desire and his will for mankind and to realize what we have lost so that we're battling for what's most important to God. And about 32 years ago, you guys have heard me tell this a thousand times, I prayed a prayer when I gave my life to Christ in September of 1988 that I did not understand when I was praying. You ever do that? You ever pray something and find out years later that uh, it was God-ordained prayer because you, you wasn't smart enough to pray that by yourself? Uh, that's what this was for me. And at that chair in Cairo, I remember kneeling down that night, and I had been unintentionally lied to about God. And I prayed this when I prayed. God, no man will ever lie to me about you again. I will seek you out for myself. Now, I said that not thinking that I would never hear what anybody else had to say about God, but I said it, I don't even think I understood it at that time, with the intentions of whatever I heard somebody say about God, I would go seek it out in his word. You understand what I mean? And that is a great way to live your life. Less chance of getting fooled by everything coming up and down the road. Don't just jump on what somebody said and run off and it's God because it may not be. There's been a thousand times more than that that men have said things that had nothing to do with God. There's pastors today that's standing up. One of them running in Georgia for the Senate or for the Congress right now that is a, an ordained pastor that upholds abortion. I'm sorry. You don't have to do a lot of praying to figure that out. All you got to do is run back to Scripture where the Bible says we're not allowed to kill anybody. And we find out that you don't have a right to slaughter a child in its mother's womb. You don't have to have a revelation. An angel doesn't have to appear. You just have to read the Word. Amen. And I think it's time that we go back and find out what's been lost. And in the process, find out what God's original plan is. And begin to work that in our lives. Now that's going to take a heart that is willing to seek after God and once you find out truth, submit yourself to it. There's a difference between knowing truth and submitting to it. Amen. So, the battle is not in what you know, it's in what you do. Amen. Genesis 1, 26 says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image. I want you to, if you would, to underline that word image right there. According to our likeness. God said, this is what God said. This is before any man had ever drawn a breath. There was no opinions to be given. God said, let us make man in our image. Amen. Which means that before the fall of man, man was created to look like God and to act like God. He wasn't God, but he was made in the image of God. In other words, God was the pattern for humanity. So we see that God is looking for somebody that looks like him. Now, he is the God of the universe. He rules everything. And if he's going to make somebody in his image, then they need something to rule over. He didn't just create them to walk around in circles. And you're going to find out today that in the garden, Adam was not just laying around uh, doing nothing. He had a job to do. And the fact that he didn't do his job is what's caused a lot of the problems today. And if I could tell you that where the authority structure comes in, as we step into the role of those made in the image of God, a lot of the problems we find are because of things we didn't take care of. Amen. But aren't you glad that we serve a God that's willing to hit the reset and let us start all over again and capture back what the enemy has stolen from us? Listen to this. It's amazing to me that as soon as he mentions his image, he, mention, he mentions dominion. Because God is a warrior. He is a ruler. He is a king. If he's going to create something in his image, they're going to have the same passions that he does. Listen, 
Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over every, excuse me, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Everybody look at me. You have authority over creeps. Verse 27 says, So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. As soon as God creates something in his image and begins to speak dominion over them, then he follows it up with a blessing. Listen to this. Verse 28 says, Then God blessed them. Why? Because he is the God of the blessing, and they are made in the image of their God. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Oh, I want to say something. For all you married couples out there, God wants you to have sex. That's the truth. When he, there's nothing wrong with that. When he says be fruitful, multiply, what do you think he's talking about? The problem's when you try messing with somebody that ain't your husband or what. Amen. It's true. He, he wanted them to be fruitful and multiply to the point that they filled the earth and subdued it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. You have just heard God's perfect will for mankind. That's it. It's original. First time it was ever said, God said it. It was his plan. Man was supposed to follow God's instructions to the T. In the middle of this creation that God has created, He takes man and He puts him in a garden. And I, and I love this, and someday I'll get to explore this a little bit more with you, but it fascinates me that it says God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And it makes me wonder if He didn't take the seeds of things that was already created and specifically plant this garden just for man. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 2, then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend it and keep it. Now, I want to stop right here for a moment because when you get to heaven, you're not going to float around on a cloud with an angel feeding you grapes and fanning you. That's not what you're going to do. God has plans for me and you once we get to heaven. It is, it, listen to this, that word, now we, we think about work being part of the curse and the only reason it's part of the curse is because Adam would then till the ground and it would not yield its strength to him. He was always called to be a tent, to tend the garden and to keep it. God's got a job for you. And I'm going to tell you something. If you had a job in the garden, I suggest you get a job now. You're not here to live off everybody else. Don't shout me down now. The word tend is a word right there in the Greek that means to be a husbandman, to work and to take care of the Garden of Eden. It was a beautiful place. And the difference between that garden and the ones we work in is that every seed Adam put in the ground produced a hundredfold. Amen. Okay. The next word you see there is he's to tend it and to keep it. The word keep means to guard when the Bible says, I think it's in the book of Proverbs, keep your heart with all diligence. It means guard your heart with all diligence. Now I want to say this to you. God knew that Satan had already raised the rebellion. There would be nothing for Adam to guard against unless there was an enemy loose. And God has just given him authority over everything that creeps on the earth. Everything. Everything. Every animal, everything, Adam has authority over. It's going to be kind of a history lesson this morning, and we'll get into more of this later on. 
So he told Adam two things. I want you to take care of the garden, and I want you to guard it. When the Bible tells you to guard your heart, it's saying that so with the understanding that there's an enemy of your soul. And you need to pay attention to what happens in your heart. Amen? All right. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. And that cold God was like, You can have anything you want. That sounds like somebody that wants his people living in abundance. Doesn't it? But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day you shall, that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Pretty simple, isn't it? Now I can't prove this. And if anybody's listening to me on Facebook Live, I think that, I think that that tree represents something that belongs to God that he expects you to take care of but get no benefit from. Sounds like the tithe to me. I can't figure that out right there. I'm not telling you it is, but that's exactly what it sounds like. A tree that's yielding things. We know later on that when man eats of it, that his eyes are open and God himself says he's become like one of us. It was something that belonged to God. And man was to work it and to guard it and to take care of it and never eat anything from it. Amen. That's holy. That's sanctified. That's set apart. That's something that's not common and not within the rights of your use. And he tells Adam, don't eat of that tree. Sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? Wouldn't you like to go back there and put a knot on his head? Now Adam is made in the image of God. He, God is his God. He's his father. As long as Adam stays submissive to God. There's a law or a rule or a statement made in Scripture that you need to underline and recognize in the life of Adam first, but in the life of every human being, including you, uh, from here on out. And it's found in Romans chapter 6, verse 16. I want you to turn there, if you would, because I think it's important that you know where this is and that you underline this truth. This truth remains intact today. We don't get to change this. The blood of Jesus doesn't change this. You need to know that. This is what it says. Romans 6, 16. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourself servant to obey, his servant you are to whom you obey whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto life. Now let me clear that up for you just a little bit. Whoever you obey is your God. Jesus makes a statement in Scripture. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do nothing, none of the things that I tell you to do? That's, an, that's, an exact, that's impossible. Because whoever you yield yourself to to obey, that's who your God is. For a lot of people that's living their life thinking that all they can, they can do whatever they want and just run back and repent and never live a life of obedience before God, you have lost your ever-loving mind. That is not true. Because the Bible says who you yield yourself to to obey, that who you're the servant of. Amen. Oh, now we're talking on the edges of holiness, and that'll just scare everybody, won't it? Amen. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 says this. <laughs> I want you to see this. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field. What's Adam have authority over? And the Cretes, that's right, Kara. Over everything that God has created, Satan, or, or excuse me, Adam has authority over, and Satan appears in the garden in the form of something that Adam has control of.
And God had said, You're, I sent you here to keep the garden and guard it. Who you suppose he's supposed to guard that from? That's right. That guy sounds like a better preacher than me. But Satan comes in. Now, now I want to I remind you of something. And I know this is not popular in this day and age. But Adam was created first and then Eve. You see the authority structure. It's talked about in Scripture. It's not popular today. I could care less. It is the truth. The man is to be the head of the house. Doesn't mean he's the dictator. It means that they walk together. It doesn't mean that she drives him or manipulates him or rules him. He's not your child to raise. And if you're having trouble with him, get before God, the only one that can do something about him. Don't shout me down now. Verse 3 says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Number one, Satan proves himself a coward when he doesn't approach the man of the house, the head of the house, but tries to slip in through the woman. Now, I would love to tell you that Adam's on the other side of the garden doing something, but Scripture says that he's right there with her, watching and not guarding the woman that God had given him. Should have stomped his foot and run that serpent out of the garden. Don't shout me down, you're living with him and you've got the same right today as they did back then. And he questions the word of God. He said, as God indeed said, you shall eat of every tree of the garden. He knew there was a tree that they weren't supposed to touch. Or excuse me, that's not true. A tree they were not supposed to eat from. And the woman said to the serpent, verse 2, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. Now think about this. You think about this giant garden that's got trees that are producing. It's not like an orchard you'd walk into today where some things are dying and some things are falling over. You're talking about every tree producing anything you could ever want to eat except for that one. Don't we carry Adam's nature in us? Sometimes you just got to let folks touch the stove to find out it's hot because they sure won't listen to you tell them. Don't touch, hey man, you, you kids playing here, don't touch the stove, it's hot. In a little bit, somebody comes running in there, ah, because they got to do what you're not supposed to do. That's the nature, the fallen nature, or the falling nature of God. I want to make a note right here for you before we move any further. You were made in the image of God. Now, we look at the world today and we tell people, you were made in the image of God. No, that's not accurate. If you're born again, you get the nature of God back. But the fall of man marred mankind. And he is no longer the image of God. And aren't you glad about that? I think it's one of the things that confuses everybody. We're like, I don't understand how man can be what he is because he's made in the image of God. How can you torture and kill and harm and hurt and destroy people? We're made in it. No, you're not. Jesus told the Pharisees, he said, you're of your father, the devil. At the fall of man, headship changed. Because of what I read to you just a few moments ago in Romans chapter 6. We all have a choice to make as we go through life. We're either going to obey God or we're going to obey the enemy. And when temptation comes, we make the choice as to who our master truly is. Are you okay with me so far? And the woman said, we may eat the fruit of the tree of the garden, verse 2, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, 
nor shall you touch it lest you die. That's not accurate. God told them if they eat of that tree, they would die. He did not say if you touched it. He expected them to take care of it. Amen. What an awesome place for Adam to have stepped in and said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Started out as questioning the word till it comes straight against the word of God. Sin is subtle. For God knows that in the day you eat of your your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. The only thing that was missing that God had not given them was the knowledge of good and evil. He just made them in his likeness. Now, I, I tell you all this, and we'll talk about this for a few more minutes, but I tell you all of this so that you and I can focus our lives on taking back what God originally wanted for our lives. I would love to see the authority structure get set back in the house. I think we would see a turnaround in our nation. Because we went from dad to mom, and now we're at the place where kids run the house. Now it isn't, it isn't uh, kids have time to do what we want, but we spend our lives serving our kids. I think we'll take care of our kids. I think we'll love our kids. I believe we ought to be good to our kids, but I don't believe our kids should drive our lives or make decisions on everything that happens in our house. And I think that if we go back and see God's original plan and the purpose for how he wants things done, that what Jesus done at Calvary can bring a powerful change in our lives. Amen? You need to understand Romans chapter 6 carries powerful amount of weight whom you yield yourself servant to that's whose servant you are it's not about what you say it's about what you do amen Uh, Genesis chapter 3 let me just finish this up I just wanted to lay a foundation because I want to talk about authority and, and where how it works in our lives You'll find, and let, let me just make a couple points here before I read out of Genesis chapter 3, and let me show you something. The only way, and this will be a great word, I, I'm not kidding. I thought about this, and I thought that this, is, this has been the problem. The only way our authority works is if we stay submitted to the structure that God put in our lives. Starting, first of all, with Him. Matter of fact, you can just stay with him because he's the one that said, uh, wives submit to your husbands and husbands love your wives like Christ loved the church. So you can do that and do it unto him even though it benefits your husband or wife. Are you with me? Do you understand what I'm saying? Our our authority gets short-circuited when we step outside of those boundaries just like Adam's did. Adam, just a few moments before was in control of the whole world and all the creation of God. And because he decided to obey somebody other than God, it stole from him the authority that God had given him. Basically, he said, I have, I have authority over you, but I'm going to submit to you, Satan. That's exactly what he done. I see this stuff all the time. I see people that are in authority positions who submit to the people that are supposed to be with them and working for them until the person that's working for them is telling the person who's the boss what to do. I see it in houses. I see guys walking around behind their wives like little puppies. And it just drives me nuts. I'm serious. 
And then we get in prayer meetings and wonder where the prayer, where the power of God is. I'll tell you where it is. It's inside that authority structure. And if we'll ever come back to it, I believe we can walk in the same authority that Jesus demonstrated when he walked in his three and a half years of ministry. Boy, my mind, this is going a lot different than it is today. I thought you people were going to be going, whoo-hoo, yes. But the problem is to walk in, a, in submission means that we have to let go of our rights sometimes. And let go of our wants. I don't care how much you want to eat of the tree of knowledge and good and evil, woman. We're not going to do it because God said it. Man, that needs to become part of our vocabulary again. I'm, I'm going to tell you, I, I'd love to, but God said I can't. Boy, I'd love to climb in the back seat with you. I'm going to tell you, man, I'm really, I'd like to do that, but, but God said. Are you with me? I'm serious. And we wonder, why do we pray? And it seems like nothing happens. And the moment that Adam stepped out from underneath the protection of the obedience to God's word, it stripped him of the power of God. As a matter of fact, check this out. I've been looking at this thing. I got five minutes. I've been looking at this thing. I got figured out. Adam was in the garden for about 100 years from what I can tell you. It says that, uh, that they didn't have kids until after the fall. There was, a, a, uh, excuse me, Cain and Abel. Cain killed Abel. Then it says when he was 130 years old, he had Seth. So I'm thinking somewhere after, somewhere 100 years, somewhere around there, they were in the garden. And for 100 years, they walked around naked and didn't know it. You know why? They were clothed with the presence of God. I believe the glory of God was on Adam and Eve. They were made in the likeness of God. And they could hold that glory of God in their life. And they walked around and didn't realize they were naked until they fell. And when they fell, something was taken from them that they could never get back by themselves. The moment they eat of the tree, their eyes were open. And immediately Adam and Eve go and sow fig leaves together and try to cover themselves. And God comes down to talk to them in the cool of the day. And he says, Adam, where are you? And he said, I'm hiding because I'm naked. I've been stripped of something that you gave me. And God said, you ate of that tree, didn't you? That's the only thing that's in here that could do that to you. I think sometimes we think we know better than God. And friends, we really don't. I think that God wants us to get back the place of authority that we are called to walk in in the body of Christ, to function. I've noticed something about leaders over the last 15 years, and I've been guilty of this. I've tried to get this out of my life to get rid of it because I know that it's wrong. I've watched in putting people in positions around here and, and being a part of other things that every leader wants people to follow them, but few leaders want to follow anybody. And it's dangerous. I just taught a Bible college course here a while back, taught one of the classes, and in the class this is a statement I made to them to head it off because it was about uh, leadership I said any leader you find that will not follow is a leader you better not follow because me shooting from the hip on my own will do you nothing but get you in a bunch of trouble but if I say things in line with what God has said now it's not me speaking are you with me to reestablish that authority without arrogance, without pride, without trying to dominate in, in any way like that, but to be a person of authority. Listen, brothers and sisters, 
What I'm talking to you about is what's most needed right now in the church and in our homes than anything else. We need fathers that know what God said. We need mamas that know what God said. Teaching their children. Satan has lied to us and we've bought it. Look at me and I'm closing. Listen to me. I'm not trying to be hard. I fell, I fell for this so many times. We are so caught up with reaching out around the world. And listen, I'm not saying we shouldn't do that. We'll continue to do that. But it's one of those things we should do once we get everything taken care of at home. We want to win the natives in Africa to Christ and re don't realize that our kids are slipping away. And the truth of the matter is we can go to Africa and look the part as long as we only stay about a week. But unfortunately our kids have to live with us every day. I'm going to ask you to pray with me. I know there's more to God than we've ever, we've, than we've ever known. I know that there's a deeper walk. I know that the power of God is spoken about in Scripture. But it's going to take a people that do something different than what everybody else is doing that comes back and submits themselves to the authority of God, whether at the time we like it or not. I think I just lost you right there. Everybody started looking down. It's not easy. Submission is not easy. And I'm going to tell you the key to submission. Well, I'm going to tell you a truth about submission. Submission is only true submission when you disagree with the person that has authority over you. I want to say that again. Submission is only true submission when you disagree with the leader that is over you. Because if you agree with them, it's agreement. If God says, go do this, and that's what you want to do, then it isn't, it, submission means I'd rather not do that. But because you said, who's that sound like? I'd rather not do this, but because you said it. Who's that sound like? Father, if there be any other way, let this hour pass me by. But not my will, Lord. Not what I want to do, but what you want me to do. I'm going to ask you to stand with me, please. I want to ask you to continue with us in prayer over our nation. And in the process of praying over our nation, I'm going to ask you to pray over our homes. Because our nation got here because our homes got robbed. Seriously. Our nation is, we're trying to fix a nation when we don't have our house where it needs to be. And authority starts at home. Starts in our attitudes toward one another. It starts on the way we react to things that we don't like. Seriously. Starts at home. If we're going to rebuild our nation, we're going to have to rebuild our homes. Because, listen to this, any time you see God do anything major, He does not start out with a nation he starts out with a family you just heard god can you imagine can you imagine looking at a man and woman standing on this planet of what we know the size of this thing is and god looks at a husband and a wife and says be fruitful and multiply and subdue the whole earth his intention was to bring a people but he's talking to a husband and wife he's talking to a family when, when the world got so wicked that God repented that he ever made it and destroyed it, he kept a family. Just one family. Isn't that right? 
started with a husband and wife, Noah and his wife and his uh, three sons. When he decided to cut covenant and bring the Christ into the world, when he started building the, the nation that Christ would come out of, he started with family. He started with Abraham and Sarah. And when he brought the Christ child into the world, he started with Joseph and Mary. Can I tell you, there's still hope to be had because there's still family in this nation. If you and I will return to the things that are most important, it can start right here and it can start right now. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you today, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. I pray, Lord God, for revelation knowledge as we go home and continue to study and read to flow out of this into each one of our lives, God, that we might take our place in the authority structure of God. We are now made in the image of the Lord as we, as the breath of life has entered us once again. We thank you, Lord. We praise you for it. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, and amen. As we get ready to leave, let me encourage you to start a one-year Bible reading program. Get with your husband or wife. Find one. Get on it. This is uh, January the 3rd. you got three days to catch up on. That's doable. I would encourage you to do that. I love you all. Let's keep in prayer by January the 6th. If you want to come tomorrow and help, see Kara. God bless you and go home. <laughs>